Hey guys, welcome back to Star Wars Timeline. My name is Ben. Today, I'm very happy to introduce Jonathan Cohn. John, very happy to see you. You and I have not talked at all. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit where people can find your awesome YouTube channel where you review tons of books and your social media channels. And just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Ben, thank you for having me on the channel. I am a, a booktuber. I try to do a wide variety of genres. Uh, my most popular at the moment has been Star Wars, mm -hmm. although I do cover Star Trek books. I cover fantasy novels, general science fiction, um, political thrillers, legal thrillers, mystery. So I'm, I'm trying to get into as many genres as I can. Um, I try to review as often as I can. So I, mm -hmm. I typically, you know, not always, but typically try to do about four videos a week. Um, uh, and I try not to do like all Star Wars one week or something. I try to spread it out. Uh, so if you just search at Jonathan Cohn on uh, YouTube, that's the way to find me. It's uh, the last name's K-O-A-N. Um, and then you can also find my Twitter uh, is also at Jonathan Cohn. Uh, those, and then my Goodreads, where I write my written reviews, is my my Goodreads name is Jonathan Cohn. Uh, so I keep it all very consistent, thankfully. And uh, uh, for for Twitter is where I typically am focused a little bit more on maybe like movies and and, and other th topics. Um, but for for my YouTube channel, it's exclusively books. Um, uh, so I don't like do movie reviews necessarily on there, mm -hmm. uh, but I talk about tie-ins to movies if they're book related. So that's where you can find all my stuff. Awesome. And as usual, guys, with all my podcasts, all the relevant links will be embedded directly into this video links in the video section below. So you can always follow Jonathan and check out his awesome content. And I sort of interacted with you briefly on uh, Twitter, but I think this will be a pretty interesting discussion because we don't know each other. Yeah. And I'd like to begin with like, before we jump into the topic of what we really want to unpack here today is just to get to know the person, you know, across the screen, what's going on here. Tell me a little bit about yourself, whatever you feel you want to include, like your childhood, where you grew up what what interests you had, you know, how reading came into your life and so on. Well, uh, I I came into reading very late in terms of it being for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, for my whole life, uh, I up until up until high school, I hated reading, um, and it's just it was totally unappealing to me. Every time it was like I was being force fed uh, to read. I hated it, and uh, we moved around a lot. Uh, and eventually, uh, when I was about uh, in well, well the the earliest memories i have of enjoying books mm -hmm. were the um uh uh first i i read in lower elementary school the jedi apprentice series uh by jude watson and but i don't like i don't remember much from them mm -hmm. and then i uh the first book i picked up because I, I wanted to was i i was a big fan of back in the day of the phantom menace i've since cooled on it a little bit but i was a big fan of phantom menace and i saw cloak of deception mm -hmm. which is basically a, a phantom menace prequel and so and i was what 10 at the time and i was like i'm gonna read this and i <laughs> uh i got the book and i brought it home and my i was talking to my parents about all the politics in it and all the tax stuff and they're like you're never interested in this stuff what's going on um because i'd always been a star wars fan but mm -hmm. i was not a reader and then I really started reading when, with two books. One was the the Young Jedi Knight series by um uh by Kevin Anderson and Rebecca Mesta. Um, that my brother in law gave me those when I was in middle school, and then uh and in high school I started I, I saw Lords of the Sith by Paul S Kemp in the bookstore, mm -hmm. and I loved the cover. It's a it's a gorgeous cover, and I was like, you know what, I'll pick that up. And it was one month before. Uh, it was like late November, early December of 2015. So it was right before um, The Force Awakens was set to come out. And so I was, uh, so I read uh, Lord of the Sith, loved it. And I saw that there was a timeline of other books. And I was like, mm -hmm. I need to get into the timeline. So that's when I started seriously. And ever since then, I've been really getting into reading a lot of books. And you'll notice all of these that I mentioned were all Star Wars related. Right. It's because that was like the, the breaking in point. And since then, I've since totally expanded but i've used star wars as like the entryway mm -hmm. and it, uh even as an adult i use star wars as an entryway to read new genres for example delilah dawson who just had the book inquisitor rise of the red blade come out 
uh, I read some of her Star Wars books and enjoyed them uh-huh. and then saw she wrote middle grade horror. I saw she wrote um, uh, YA dystopian. I saw she wrote an adult horror novel. And I was like, I'm going to give her other books a shot. And it was introducing me to new genres. And Timothy Zahn got me into his general science fiction stuff, which mm-hmm. is totally different than his star wars writing style mm-hmm. um and uh you know so i got into star trek because john jackson miller uh also wrote star trek and i'm a huge john jackson miller fan so i really enjoyed that i've been able to use star wars as like a, a stepping stone even though i still love it and still talk about it all the time right. i would i used that um uh the re- reading to get into other stuff and so now i'm I'm in all the genres mm-hmm. uh and so that's been the that's why star wars books have had such an impact on me and why on my channel at least i cover them so much nice that's awesome so here you have it folks star wars as an ultimate trampoline starting point <laughs> to the larger world of literature and i think it's just a beautiful story man you start off somewhere and then the discovery the thrill yep. of it oh hold on a second there's classic literature this this and that you know with me uh i'm originally from russia i was 14 mm-hmm. when i came here to new york but i basically saw the last 10 years or eight years of soviet union so i started my schooling mm-hmm. in soviet union and back then we had summer required reading where they would give you from 10 to 20 classic books of fiction that you had to read or select from the 20 and read a certain amount of them that you would write and report during school time and like for, like yourself it was a task man it was daunting i hated it because you were pushed to read i was like i don't like this and when we moved in russia our dad who was a huge huge book buff he bought us uh, this what is called children's world classics library of books which is 50 plus books beautifully illustrated all in hardcover introducing classic from all over the world translated into russian so you could expand the child's imagination and world from britain from france from jules verne from james Fenimore cooper and stuff like this and my dad was very tricky he you know obviously for a lot of children their parents read for them because before they're able to do so themselves but when i've got the knowledge i got the skills to read on my own first grade he put treasure island on my home desk and just left it there as if the book needed to be put back and i came from school like hold on a second what is this doing here from the moment i grabbed the book i said hold on a second pirates what's going on here like a page a couple of pages in i was sucked in so the first book i read was treasure island and sort of from there as a kid like yourself i wasn't much into reading at all it was generally a chore for me because it takes time. You sit down with a book to read a chapter, it takes a certain amount of minutes or maybe hours, depending on the book. But I really started getting into it mid to post college, where mm-hmm. I said, hold on, it's now I can prioritize. I, I don't need this. All right, I'm not in high school anymore. These are my you know, elective courses in college. I can now spend time doing me, doing things that I enjoy. So I, as a kid, I sort of was kind of like introduced to the culture of reading with world classics, but I really started getting heavily into it when I came to America and I started exploring the science fiction book aisle in the Barnes and Nobles and checking out all those American authors. But just in general, give me a very, very brief summary. Like as a kid, what in general movies, TV shows that you enjoyed as a kid? Well, uh, as a kid, uh, we, when I was younger, like pre age 10, Mm -hmm. we actually didn't consume that much, um, uh, media. We did, um, uh, when it comes to movies, of course, we were were always fans of star Wars and we watched the, the pirates, of the Caribbean movies and and Mm -hmm. some Disney stuff, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a huge part consuming media and stuff like this. Um, and a lot. And then once we, once we got direct TV is when we started getting into to movies mm-hmm. and TV shows more. Uh, and then I guess in preteen to teen years is when we started getting into, uh, you know, Marvel. I was a huge fan of the Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, they've, they've, they're, they're, they're not the same quality as they, they used to be, but they're, I still, I still, I've been so ingrained in the Marvel train that mm-hmm. I still kind of feel obligated to keep watching because it's been, I've been part of that fandom for so long. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other, when it comes to movies, there weren't really, um, uh, movie franchises otherwise that we really right. got into until when I was either a older teenager or young adult, when I got into things like Star Trek movies mm-hmm. and, uh, then the Star Trek books, and then also really into like fantasy 
projects. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, those are those are big fandoms I'm I'm part of now, and uh, with regard to fantasy, the first fantasy book I ever read was uh, Terry Brooks's Sword of Shan- Shannara, which I, I heard two that. things about it. Yeah. I heard two. I heard two things. One was Terry Brooks used to write for Star Wars, which mm-hmm. um, uh, he did write the uh, Phantom Menace. Uh, novelization Mm -hmm. but the other thing i heard was that it's basically an easier to read lord of the rings and i thought hey that's exactly what i want (laughs) because i tried reading lord of the rings and that did (laughs) when i was younger that did not work out so Mm -hmm. i've since read it and love it but i i picked up sword of shannara and i was like oh my goodness i love this type of storytelling right and and then in future books he kind of does his own um he he does new things Mm -hmm. uh his new stories and then eventually I got started getting friends involved. And so um, uh, I got a friend who had never read fantasy novels. He'd read Harry Potter. If you mm-hmm. consider that fantasy, it's more YA. But he'd read Harry Potter and he'd read um, Lord of the Rings and that was it. And so I, I I got him into that and he's pretty much lapped me. He's read even more mm-hmm. genre novels because he's now so into it, which is – and we like did book clubs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So those are the 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 – the different uh like franchises and stuff i was i was into yeah see with me as a kid um when we moved in russia and my dad had a pretty good uh uh job he worked at a souvenir fabric we were the first kids on the block to get a vhs player which at the time was hugely expensive we got this german set of television and a vhs player called telefunken and in Russia, you could go and see Western movies in theaters, but as far as legitimate, like licensed VHS tapes, you couldn't get them. So everything mm. was pirated and you had to go and buy it on like on a market or something. And since childhood, because I had access to, I can now have the option to watch the stuff that I like on demand via VHS. We used to right. co- like invite all the friends, all the kids from the block that I grew up in and watch these movies and you know we had something like ray harryhausen's sinbad and jason and the argonauts movies and you know clash of titans it just blew our mind so me growing up as a kid and then then there was indiana jones and the robocop and the terminator and back to the future all russian kids basically grew up with part of this partially with this western culture and star wars was never the pinnacle of it it was definitely there you know the original trilogy was like it was definitely a sacred thing it's part of your home tv kind of like shrine but then there was indiana jones and all these other things and star wars was just a part of it and it's a point that i want to sort of illustrate to our conversation i don't know if it's similar for you than me for you obviously seems like star wars books were a huge huge part very pivotal for you in your reading experience but for me where i the entry point wasn't just star wars alone there was always things out there uh, but i also wanted to ask in regards before we move on Aside from just movies, were any particular role models that you aspire to? Specific cures are like, oh my God, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like this guy or this lady has very like interesting qualities that I want to incorporate in my life. I don't know. My dad um, is a school administrator and he mm-hmm. works very hard. And I now am a school teacher. Um, so, I am, so I'm following in the same footsteps as he nice. is. So I guess that would be one of my... Um, uh, one of my role models i really liked um uh uh jeff shara who wrote a lot of the um like civil war books mm-hmm. um lost civil war novels and his father wrote the killer angels um uh which was eventually turned into the movie gettysburg and uh, i always thought you know that'd be so cool i get to write fiction novels but mm-hmm. based on historical events like that i always thought that was a cool idea um growing up uh, although now, if I if I became an author, it'd probably be in the media tie-in fiction mm-hmm. uh, realm. But uh, I guess so. I guess he would be a, a role model. Uh, yeah, that's those are pre- my my dad was the big. I think the biggest the the biggest impact because I actually did uh, you know learn like he did show me a lot of stuff of what he mm-hmm. did as an as an administrator, um, and he got me interested in like business stuff. Uh, so I'm really interested in like, I like, I sometimes enjoy videos, like for instance, with movies, I enjoy videos on the business side of like how much money they make and how much they need to make and that stuff more than I enjoy the, the review of the, the movie itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's, it's a craft, you know, when when we look Mm -hmm. at all art in general, whether it's like sculpture or interactive media, like video games or, or movies, it's a craft. 
It's not just, you know, an expression of your art, of your thoughts, or you know, bestow upon the world. It's It takes a, a, a lot of hard work. There's cinematographers, there's editors, there's sound designers that put this whole thing together. And you're absolutely right, just going behind the screen and observing the process. And you know what's funny? Even when the movie crashes severely and there's not just a good outcome, you still can appreciate how much hard work went into it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. For me, one of the biggest role models was, it, look, first of all, Jonathan, it's absolutely beautiful when you have a father figure that you can aspire to, that influenced you in so many positive ways. I always find it's a, a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. It's a huge privilege to have a, a home where your father has so much love and wants to like only the best for you. And like kind of you, you admire the father figure so much you want to emulate right. them. But as far as fictional characters go, I definitely Luke Skywalker was, was one of them for me. First, oh, oh uh I wasn't okay. You, I'll, I'll get you the chance. You, <laughs> that was kind of I was leading into, but I really <laughs> wanted to hear your answer. But for me, it was Luke Skywalker. Reason number one, because my oldest cousin really looked like young Mark Hamill. I was like, oh my, <laughs> hold on a second, that's not my cousin in the movie, right? No, it's not. But I kind of want to be like both because my oldest cousin was very athletic when he was younger, and what really struck my imagination as a child was Luke confronting his fear. Right, every kid is afraid of something, afraid of the dark or afraid of this big bully in school. It's something that they overcome. And that specific moment where Luke is in the cave and he is wrestling with the shadow of his father, I was like, oh my God, it takes so much guts to be able to stand up to this stuff. I want to be like him when I grow up. How about yourself? So uh, now, now that I, I wasn't thinking, I just for some reason didn't think of fictional characters that could mm -hmm. be the, the role model. But now that you say that, I do have one, and that would be Gandalf. Uh -huh. um, uh, because, you know, I loved the Lord of the Rings movies as a kid. And uh, every time I watched them, he was like the one person who was mm -hmm. like bringing the sane argument. And he's the one person who's like this, like he has the answers. If everybody yeah. just listens to Gandalf, <laughs> those movies would be way shorter. <laughs> um, and so I'm always, and and when I read other books, I'm yeah. always like, if you guys just listen to Dumbledore, he's got all the answers. If you listen to Al-Anon from Shannara, he's got all the answers. And so whenever I'm reading something like that, I'm uh, I'm just like, I, I, I aspire to having that level of wisdom and right. knowledge to be able to handle a situation like that and uh so so i would i would say gandalf and then the other one is i watched these movies as a kid but didn't really um uh appreciate them until i was an adult mm -hmm. uh but now i think i can as uh, understand this is the uh, mission impossible movies ah particularly nice. the more the more recent ones but um that that i enjoy the, the earlier ones aren't as fun but you know four and five came out when i was a, a teenager and six came out when i was a teenager mm -hmm. and uh those those three movies you see a character ethan hunt who like is refusing to compromise the moral ideas right uh and every time he kind of goes rogue or every time he kind of has to 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 change the plan it is always to protect lives and to yeah to do the right thing and you see how hard it is for him that yeah. like is it's not a fun like like it's he's he's not someone i want his life because that's not fun but that's it's always hard. for a noble cause it's always for cause. a noble cause mm -hmm. and i i always admired that and mm -hmm. i always thought you know i do want to work for a noble cause so i i did appreciate that a lot that's a cool role model. I love Tom Cruise. I, I'm so excited to see the new one. And I agree with you totally. I think the latter films uh, have become stronger. Yeah. Like they've become more intricate totally with politics. And of course, the, the, his heroic arc, the things that he has to work on becomes more elaborate. And of course, all the visual special effects is just crazy, man. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to the new one. Have you seen it yet? Oh yeah, I've 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 gone a couple times. It's nice. very it's very entertaining. Um, it's not my favorite of the series, but mm -hmm. it's it's very good. I, me and my younger brother, we generally enjoy going to movies together. I'm just waiting. I'm like, come on, bro, get your stuff together. <laughs> we gotta go see this. I have to, I have to drag my brother or two. <laughs> nice. You got an older brother or younger? Yeah, old, older brother. Older yeah. brother. That's cool. So now let's move directly into stuff that I want to talk about. And like the title of this video will say, once it's published, it's basically the differences between reading a story, experiencing it in film versus video games, just different forms of, of experiencing the movies and the advantages of reading. But before that, just a small little set of questions I had on the story, characters, and a lasting impression overall. And now we're talking just a story in general, regardless of medium. Jonathan, what is a good story? 
Ooh. Well, for me, it has to do with um, uh, promises and payoffs. Mm. Uh, I've learned from my book reviewing that the thing that either sells the story the most or um, tanks the story the hardest is a promise and payoff. Um, uh, if you just uh, give me the promise. This is going to be a fun fantasy novel. And you set up that there is a potential chosen one in the beginning of the book. You have to pay off in some way that person doing something heroic that 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 pays off the idea of being a chosen one. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to have made the journey worth it. Um, and and so so many times I can point to books where I thought you know, the, the book had some really interesting ideas. And at the beginning of the book, I was like, all right, here we go. And then they don't really do anything with those ideas. And the author decides to either subvert expectations or decides that they wanted to focus on something else. And so when that happens, I'm like, I'm not as interested anymore because you didn't, you didn't follow through. And, and you can still have, if you have a series something where something doesn't pay off in the immediate book, mm -hmm. but the general arc of a story needs to have promises at the beginning and, and payoffs uh, later on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would say a good example of this is a game of Thrones TV show, because there were excellent promises made at the beginning. And for the first several seasons, they continuously paid off each season well, mm -hmm. while also still leaving more payoffs for the future and they consistently had that but then there's a point where the payoffs were not as good is because they didn't seem as telegraphed a lot of the stuff in season eight it's not that so and so killing the night king i'm not, not going to spoil it for people but so and so right. killing the night king isn't the worst idea but if you didn't set it up it becomes unfulfilling and uh, you know, some people argue that a certain character who turns evil in the final season, that it was totally justified. And I would have been more okay if that had been like a gradual change, but it seems to just like happen super fast in the last two seasons that it just doesn't feel that, that payoff properly. Right. And so that's an example of, you know, they, they were doing, they had the formula really good for the first five, six seasons, and then they didn't keep the formula. So gotcha. Cool. You know, one show that comes to mind where they do this exceptionally well, you know, this criteria of giving you a promise of something and then fulfilling it is Stranger Things. I, I would argue yes. that although mm -hmm. one season may be a little stronger than the other, in general, overall, it's a brilliant show that keeps on giving and ending each season with a promise that like, hey, there could potentially be more or we can cut it right there and it still works well. It's yes. brilliantly done. And I really enjoy how technical you personally get when you describe this criteria of what constitutes a good story. For example, I do the New Jedi Order book series overview mm -hmm. with Meg at Meg Reviews. She's brilliant. She's so mm -hmm. much more versed in, in just describing storytelling than I am. I tend to be a more intuitive person. Like I, I really understand what you're talking about here. You know, And I went to film school i studied animation i took like script writing and storyboarding all this stuff i understand the technical aspect of it but me naturally i'm more intuitive person so i i sort of kind of i like i used to scrutinize films and stories and books in general very in a detailed manner but then i, I sort of stepped away from it and i said hold on a second let me see let me operate in a realm of a more esoteric of feeling or gratification, or what am I left with at the end? So for me, a good story is simply the effectiveness or the talent on the storyteller's behalf to pull me into their world. And after the story ends, I'm left with something, something unforgettable, mm -hmm. something yeah. exciting, something that lasts with me for years. One perfect example I wanna bring to jump ahead a little bit is Watching Conan the Barbarian movie in Russia with Arnold, it's, a, it's an adventure film. Right? It's just mm -hmm. typical big muscle guy. There's nothing complex about it. And when I came here, I thought it was, oh, it's based on a pulpy comic books from the 60s. Oh, hold on a second. There's an author who wrote them in the 30s, Robert E. Howard. And he's regarded as a master of the short form storytelling, just like Edgar Allan Poe, which every kid in Eastern Europe, everybody knows that name. So hold on a second. And when I started paying attention to Howard, within literally within the span of one paragraph, he sucks you into his world. 
and you forget about reality and you spend the time with his characters and you live and breathe their experience and by the time their stories end it's never pure escapism it's never pure entertainment it's like oh i had fun he just slit this dude's throat he or defeated this boss this giant snake there's always an underlying universal motif there that keeps you coming back yeah i i would say that 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 thing where you have a feeling afterwards mm -hmm. is very important um uh and sometimes the feeling can be joyous and sometimes it, it can be more more sorrowful but but if if the movie makes you feel that usually means you did a good job as as filmmakers and so so many movies that a lot of people complain about i always say you know i i, I generally avoid using words like hate or mm -hmm. things like that in media i say i, I disliked it or, or felt mediocre about it but usually those are things that i'm just kind of like like if, if if i don't if you don't produce an emotion mm -hmm. i don't feel one way or the other and if i don't strongly hate or strongly love it just gets kind of lost and so you want to produce that emotion because it means that people will want to talk about it you can't just be oh you did something shocking you killed off this character or oh you did this thing that has brilliant vfx you have to do something that makes people say oh my goodness this story made me cry or oh my goodness this you know had such a lasting impact mm -hmm. and one i think to, to go to what you were talking about one good example of this is the new jedi order Mm -hmm. which is that um, up until the New Jedi Order happened, the Star Wars books under Bantam Publishing was incredibly safe. Every right. book that came out, like you, you knew you, you, your main heroes were safe and maybe the B characters were safe and maybe a C tier character <laughs> might die, but <laughs> but you, not necessarily. And you knew your villains would probably die, right. but that was about it. And you just didn't feel, um, uh, you didn't feel worried. And then Vector Prime comes out, and I won't say who, but a certain major character dies in it, and it produced such a reaction, and people yeah. were so sad, and people were angry. And I think at the time, a lot of people didn't realize that that anger should not have been taken out on the author, mm -hmm. but rather on the the characters, on on the villains of the story. And it was it was no, you you feel so connected to this character that died. And you feel so bad about it because he made you cry, because he really made you connect with the character and the people around them. So when he died, you felt what the other characters felt. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of you. You can have anger and sadness as the prime emotion that comes out of that book for a lot of people. And yet that's the correct reaction you should be having. And it's good because you connected with them. And so... uh yeah that's why that's why the that 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 book and then also from just a more meta perspective that mm -hmm. suddenly made everyone go okay everything's on the table we can we can we can do more with this we don't have to be safe anymore that's where excitement begins exactly yes yeah. so it, it 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 brought the right you know the books had been rejuvenated when zahn took over in 91 uh when he started up and then they had kind of hit a middle of a slump in the mid late 90s mm -hmm. and then this was what kind of jolted them back into the limelight of, of storytelling. I absolutely agree, yeah. And one of my professors uh, said a very interesting thing. He said, look, you don't have to necessarily always love the story or sympathize with this protagonist because so long that a story elicits an emotion, it's right. fulfilled its job. For example, you could have a story that you don't necessarily love, you despise. Like when I was a kid watching Aliens 3, mm -hmm. where the young girl Newt from, you're familiar with the franchise, right? Yeah. In, in, in the Aliens, the younger, it's a whole about the, the, the survival and the, the preserving this kid, right? Ripley, she mm -hmm. saves this little girl. And in the third movie, the movie opens up with her being dead. And then Ripley spends the rest of the film in this agonizing pain throughout the like male prison pop. I was depressed as a kid. It did not leave any happy memories. I'm like, yay, I want to watch this movie again. I couldn't stand it. Or Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, which I saw as a part of my kind of like expanding my self-awareness of world cinema and watching movies that are not necessarily comfortable. It's nauseating. It's impossible for me to rewatch that movie, but is it damn good storytelling, a powerful story? Hell yes. It's just not the type of story that gives you good feels or good vibes, but it's very important. It's a great social commentary. Yeah, and 
uh, I tend to gravitate towards the one, the books that make me, um, that make me feel more happy just because that's mm -hmm. the emotion I want to be feeling when I'm right. reading, but I'm not opposed to feeling sad. Uh, it's just the books that, 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 that produce nothing. That's just the hardest to talk about because I'm just kind of like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Do you hear yeah, a little bit of that. background? Mm -hmm. Ah, I got it. Someone's get backing up something. Somebody's cooking. Can you do you mind giving me a sec? Yeah, go ahead. All right, sorry. We'll cut this part out. Yeah. I do apologize. That is totally fine. All right. We talked about the, the alien and the not always pleasant movies. Okay. I wanted to move on to the yeah. next topic. Now, Jonathan, I wanted to continue and kind of like expand on the idea of experiencing storytelling through different mediums. Um, I wanted to start off in general with reading first, since that's the topic of our discussion. Did your parents read to you in childhood? And do you think that influenced your love for books later on? I think it did. It didn't. It took a while for it to take hold. I think they they, they spent <laughs> so long being like, why will this kid not read? Because um, my sister was a big reader, but right. I, I just, I was not. And so uh, they did read to me when I was a kid. Um, both my parents and my sister read um, I, I can specifically mention the, uh, the, the Narnia books uh -huh. when I was, when I was growing up, they would read that to me before bedtime. And, uh, interestingly to flip the table. Now my older sister, she has kids and I recorded myself reading the book, to, uh, for her to play for her kids, uh, That's at nice. night or whenever. And so it's now come full circle, the, the, re the reading, the reading the Narnia books, mm -hmm. but, uh, they did do that before. And, uh, that's. You, uh, my dad's thing when he would come home in the afternoons was he would go into our sunroom and and read for a couple hours after mm -hmm. he, after he got home from work rather than run to the TV set and he would he would turn on the TV for news and to maybe watch a show later on in the evening but it was the later priority it mm -hmm. was he his first thing when he got home after after you know talking to us as a family was to was to start reading. Um, and take the occasional nap, but, uh, <laughs> but reading was the first thing he did when he got back. And so even though it took a while, you know, it was about, uh, 15 or 16 when I actually started getting into it as a regular habit and hobby, mm -hmm. uh, I, I certainly had seen that. And so it had been ingrained for so long. And so now that's also similar for me as my goal is right when I get home from work, I try to go straight to reading. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. I think it's, especially today where so oversaturated with media and screens from small to mobile to tv to monitor computer screens you know sometimes you just want all that influx those terabytes of information coming at you from every direction especially in the new york city where i live constantly yeah. you're barraged with sounds with audio sensory you know, all this information coming in at you sometimes it's just nice to go straight to the park drop on the lawn and touch grass as they like to say right? <laughs> <laughs> just pop a book open and read it, it's just it's almost becomes like this meditative session where you're away from everything else yeah exactly uh but you said you started reading in earnest when you were like teen about 15 16 yeah. right and you said your first book that you read was narnia well uh well i mean the first books that my parents read to me um was narnia mm -hmm. uh i mean of course i'd read 
other things, you know, either for school or when my parents were like, all right, this summer, you're going to read these books and you're going to like them. So I'd done that. But the first books that I was enjoying was enjoying was getting into both the canon and the legends at the same time. Right. I didn't. I know some people who read all of the Star Wars legends and then read the canon, and then some people who are only reading the canon right now. Right. I was just at the time I wasn't as knowledgeable about both universes, and so what I did was I just went whatever whatever cover looked interesting and mm-hmm. whatever had a character or a plot line or something I was interested in, and so I was kind of mixing and matching them. Uh, gotcha. And then eventually I got to the point where I was caught up in the canon. So I had nothing else until the next one came out. So the only thing I could read was legends. Mm-hmm. Um, but that took a couple of years, but, right. but it was, it was uh, just seeing. So it's funny that with book covers, we, we always make the, the, the line, don't judge a book by its cover when talking about people, but with books, it's actually important because covers are meant to draw you in. Yeah. And so it's ironic that 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 is a phrase that works for most things in life except books <laughs> i remember one of the first books i actually purchased with my own lunch money again once again back in russia i was living in this like small private neighborhood and there was one tiny kiosk next next to my school that used to sell newspapers but they also had a couple of fictional books like a little mm-hmm. section there and as a kid, I was 10 or 11 years old, you know, like you have that hormonal change, you begin to be interested in like all the beautiful things. And it was one book, it said, the warlock in spite of himself, and it showed a naked witch flying on a broom, me being an 11 year old, ooh, what is that? I wonder if the lady will sell this to me. And she did sell it to me, and it, end- it ended up being my introduction to one of the first Western fantasy books by Christopher Stashev. It was a popular yeah. series back in the day. I'm surprised not, like, not that I talked to avid booker. He's like, oh, hell yeah, I remember Christopher Stashev. I'm like, wow, that's so awesome. It's a That huge... very much feels like 80s fantasy. <laughs> yeah, that, pretty much. That's exactly. what it was. And I even reread it recently. My first reading was in Russian back in the day in the 80s, and I recently reread it in English. It was so many flood of childhood memories, but what sold it to me was... What created that beautiful memory was the book cover. I was mm-hmm. counting it on being one thing, something like saucy with like, oh, some ladies and something, ended up being just a great fantasy book. Talking yep. about it, good that, advertising. Exactly. <laughs> and then and then there's sometimes where a good book um uh you know comes when you have a terrible book cover. Yeah. Uh but but the idea of having a good book cover is it's it's enticing. It's like mm-hmm. it's the it's the the marketing value for the book. And so you, if you want people to read it, you want to have really good book covers. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, we've we've the the book industry has been kind of chasing trends a yeah. lot. Authors, there's some authors that chase trends, but most authors are writing what they want to write generally. Um, however, the the people in the publishing industry, like the editors and the the people working on covers, they try to chase the fad. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, we don't we haven't in my opinion been getting as quality content covers as we may be used to because before we'd get full paintings that would really draw you in that were multicolored that really look like like that sold the idea of the book and now you have things where you have a a basic background and maybe uh an a a a symbol of something maybe a a big key Mm -hmm. or a big flower or something as the cover and maybe some of those can be iconic in a way but it doesn't have it doesn't feel like it has the craft it's cheaper generally it's cheaper yeah yeah it's cheaper like for example behind you i see one of my favorite trilogies of all time the dragon lance uh dragon series right and mm-hmm. it seems to be that now, like when I go, I frequently visit uh, Barnes and Nobles, like down on you know 14 Screen Union Square, and there seems to be a return to tradition. So on because the newer Dragonlance novels bring back those yep. beautiful, they beautiful covers. Like I picked up the first novel, and the new ones haven't had the chance to read it. But for one period of time, when the Dune movie just came out, they yep. started re-releasing the Dune novels with those just freaking ugly covers i'm like man what the heck is this this is so lazy and cheap yep. a little graphic design of wavy things come on man get out of town look at yes. the older covers and now mm-hmm. the trend seems to be coming full circle where kevin j anderson's recent yes. doom book right you look at the covers and those like oh my god i want to check this out i want to read this look at the freaking cover it's hopefully the trends picks up again because i think 
most of the readers want to see their heroes on screen, especially if it's something that imagination evoking as a fantasy novel. You want to see dragons, you want to see scenery. I mean, pure examples, the classic Dragonlance novels have some of the most brilliant artwork in, in book design in general. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree that really, in my opinion, the fantasy genre has, mm -hmm. has generally dominated having the best covers. I mean, there's I have a few books for sci-fi and for others that have had good covers, but fantasy just specifically draws me in. And if I can point to one, I Absolutely. one of the series that I always um, uh, try to recommend to people that I talk about that isn't really talked about on places is something called The Rune Lords. And I this was uh, yeah, <laughs> this was written by David Farland, um, who wrote for Star Wars under the name Dave Wolverton. Wolverton yeah. um, he wrote uh, Courtship of Princess Slaya, and he wrote um, the first Jedi Apprentice book. And I picked this up for a couple of reasons. One, because I had heard that he had been a professor of some of my favorite authors like Brandon Sanderson and Dan mm -hmm. Wells and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I also picked it up because this cover absolutely drew me in. Mm -hmm. I was. You know, I saw these things on here and I thought they looked like force ghosts from Star Wars. Ah. And then you had a character who's kneeling, who's got the the kind of leaves that are forming a crown over his head. Mm -hmm. And this just imagery made me think, I want to read this book to find out what's actually happening in this in this sequence, why it's mm -hmm. happening and how it's happening. And so this is a, a great example of how to really sell the idea and this scene exact scene happens exactly right. as it's portrayed on the right, cover right this and and so if they were to make a movie of this it's like this cover because it works so well in portraying what the story is i want i would want them to recreate this scene you know put the characters in such a way that if you took a picture of a movie frame it's the same as the the book cover basically mm -hmm. uh and, and and they don't do that as often but i just love this idea that you're getting you know it's a full painting and it kind of it also wraps around uh to, has a nice cover. Oh, i love that. it bantam mirror books used to do it a lot too right yes bantam yeah. bantam with the drew Suzanne's art it like basically wraps around the whole cover of the yes. book yes mm -hmm. Jonathan, so I nice. am so happy that you like you just brim with excitement when talking about book cover art. I try to like give homage and highlight every time like I have I haven't done a book review in quite a bit. I, I, you know, I'm in the middle of reading one. But generally, when the book has an excellent cover, I always like to highlight talk about mm -hmm. the artists and like they give you that experience as much as the author does. They're the first window into that story. Yes, especially I, yeah. when it's well done. And uh, it's kind of important because there's now a big discussion happening about uh, AI happening with, with cover artists. Yeah. And sometimes AI can create a cool image, but they haven't created enticing art, artwork that connects the character, that connects the tone of the book, that connects the plot that connects the feel like they, they may get like the imagery of the book, yeah. like, like, like a desert landscape and a character there, but they don't connect feeling because so much, so many great books they have, you know, you can tell on the character's faces if the character's happy or scared mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so AI just has not gotten there yet. And so it's important to have great cover artists um, uh, who are able to learn the craft. I would make an argument well. that, that, computer generated images will never communicate to the heart and soul of the reader i yes. mean because illustration is so much more than just pretty pictures a lot of people mm -hmm. can even when we talk forget ai for a second even a lot of people artisans they're able to show like a flashy beautiful girl a heroic guy on the cover but it's usually it doesn't speak anything and then right. you compare that to some great american artists like for example one of the most influential commercial artist of the 20th uh, century, Frank Frazetta. There is a mm -hmm. story in every piece of art that he did. He is as much responsible for creating Conan the Barbarian as the original author Robert E. Howard is. Right. Because he just, within this context of one illustration, he gave you a promise of a world that you've never experienced before. And I don't think computer can re uh, replicate that. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. And that's why there are some publishers I particularly enjoy um, their work. I, I would point like Tor has had this for a while, mm -hmm. um, but recently Tor has been you know moving in the trend that I don't like. But Bane Books 
it, it's so funny when you if you see a Bane book in the bookstore because they all have this similar feel, but mm-hmm. they have they if they feel like they're stuck their cover arts in the '90s or early 2000s. But I'm okay with that because each one feels like unique, like 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 that someone took some time to really paint something as mm-hmm. opposed to just putting the text on there and throwing background stuff and and foreground stuff. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, uh, once again, you're sort of reading my mind halfway through because you got into this uh, uh, section where we talk about just book covers, which was just excellent. <clears throat> but it segues really well into my next question is I wanted us just briefly to compare the experience of reading novels versus short stories versus reading comic books, which now supply pictures, because our next connection is movies, which I'm going to talk about next. But what would you say are some of the differences, like how you enjoy experiencing each one of, the, one of those mediums? Well, I've read, I've read some comics and some short stories. It's not my preferred medium, uh, either one, but I, I've read both. <clears throat> but the, uh, the reason I, I think I prefer novels is that both comics and short stories, you're very limited on the, the connectiveness. You're very limited <laughs> on the uh investment you know with the short story you start it and 20 pages later it's over Mm. and you know if you have a really scary story or if you have a really compelling like you can do a lot with that but you're very limited with that Mm. whereas with a novel or even a novel series you feel you, you you have invested so much time with um uh with, with these characters right. or with the or with the world building or something and so and in comics you get that visual but i have you know some comics that are like 100 pages long i can read that in a half an hour um and if if i if i decide to go back and really study the um the artwork uh you know it could st- spend more time than that whereas uh the average person who reads 100 pages in a novel you're spending one or two hours with that and you're getting so much more uh, story and you're getting so much uh, more uh, like words, like new words. And I know there's the argument I've seen of like um, technically comics sometimes can have uh, um, better vocabulary than the novels. And so there is value in that. But I feel like I'm, I'm I'm learning so much with a novel when it comes to prose mm-hmm. because there's just so many words that you can learn on the page. Gotcha. See, with me, uh, the older I got, the more invested I was in the short form writing because <clears throat> I feel most depends on the awareness of the storyteller to figure out what to tell you and what to withhold to amplify that interaction with the story and engage your imagination. Because when the short story is really fulfilling, when I was a kid, my older cousin and my father used to read Edgar Allan Poe to me. It, as fascinating as those and scary those stories were, a short story, and I started realizing it later when I grew up, is that there's such an economy of concepts and words and visualizations that it leaves no room for error. It demands perfection. And mm-hmm. when it's really powerfully told, it's suddenly like the, the paragraph tells you this much, but in your mind, so many more things are sparking. Going like, hold on a second, what's the, 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 the character is traversing this night alley, and he's stalking the protagonist, and this is about to happen. You go, your mind races in ten di- different directions. What's not in the novel is actually your your imagination fulfills. When I'm working with a novel, a good novel, or especially a part of a uh, uh, epic series. I just started my Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. Yeah. I did read the first uh, Rune Lord books, the one that you pointed out uh, several years ago, but I, can, I intend to continue on reading those epic series. But in those, the more details they give you, especially, for example, uh, Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings series, the more details he gives you in a scene describing the greenery or shrubs or whatever, the castles, the less pockets you have where where you can supply your own visuals or your own imagination say i want this scene to play out in this particular way when it's a short story it gives you all that room to do so with comic books i would say they're on the borderline with cinema because you are basically told a story through series of pictures because if it's a really effective comic book panel you don't need text 
you mm -hmm. should be able to deduce where the story where the action is going based on right. the images yeah and with with short stories you know probably my favorite author of short stories is o henry mm -hmm. um who wrote great twists in his stories and you know so many times um there's one of his short stories that uh, I, I vividly remember reading in school because it's basically uh, um, uh, uh, this woman's on a train and uh, you read about her uh, seeing an old friend who's mm -hmm. sitting in, an, in, in one of the, the booths and she goes up to talk to him and he's handcuffed to someone else and he tells her that he's uh, a policeman and mm -hmm. then he's bringing in the other guy to... Um, uh, to 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 the station that he's he's being tried in this other county and that's why they're on the train and so she talks with him and she keeps trying to get him to um uh to admit that he has feelings for her and he keeps, keeps basically saying well you know I, I i would but i'm so busy with this cop stuff i just don't have time to invest in a relationship or anything and so you know she she says all right that's fine and she leaves or well rather i should say the the cop and the the guy that he's with leave and someone comments something and says that's weird aren't cops usually right-handed why was he uh uh handcuffed on his left hand and then she, the 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 girl realizes no wait he wasn't actually the cop he was the the convict the cop was just not saying anything and the convict and that's why the convict wouldn't say he would get in a relationship because he knew he was going to jail and after i read that short story i was like all right i'm going back to the start and rereading it <laughs> from this new perspective and it just stuck with me because in such a short amount of time, yeah. you could make me go, wait, what? Like sometimes in a book, you have to wait a whole book before right. you get to the, like you have 400 pages before you get to the wait, what moment? Whereas mm -hmm. a short story, you can achieve that in 10 pages or less. Yeah. Or sometimes, you know, with in case, well, once again, I'd love to bring Robert D. E. Howard. The story, the beauty of this story is you can sort of predict where it's going to end. There's not earth shattering plots and the twists right. in there necessarily it's a very linear story but it's just the excellence and creativity of how he guides you through it you can't stop but keep flipping through the chapters because mm -hmm. he's able to hold your attention at every second yes the um and since it's nice with him that he his legacy was so impactful that they yeah. not only had the comics and the movies but they still do short story collections mm -hmm. um every now and then set in his universe or or novels set in his universe mm -hmm. and connecting that you know uh they eventually got the rights to the conan storyline tor did and so they gave this new author who hadn't really been tested mm -hmm. a conan series and that was robert jordan and he did a good enough and those were really short books they were like 100 pages long right. but he excelled at the 100 page books and they said all right we we trust you that you can write stories well and they let him use that as a stepping stone to writing his epic novels and mm -hmm. so after that he wrote the wheel of time mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely excellent point too that's i actually learned his name from his shorter uh conan books first novellas i guess you could call it right. like 100 yeah, yeah, pages like or less mm-hmm uh, now I want to flip the question I asked earlier and ask you, in your mind, what is the difference between a reading a story versus a watching a movie versus playing video game, if you've played any? I, I imagine you did. I do play video games occasionally, but I usually just get frustrated when I'm playing a video game. Um, uh, I I am the type of person that I, if if I'm going to be creating a story, I'd like to be the one creating the story. Mm. I don't particularly enjoy it where the when I'm playing a video game and I'm presented with five options mm. and they're like, all right, well, each one has. And I guess that's maybe more like real life where you're presented with options for things. But when, it, when I'm doing a story, it's like, I just want to see how this unfolds. Mm. I don't want to have to be the person who makes the decision of why it unfolds. And that's probably why I enjoy movies than I enjoy video games. Because in a movie, you're still getting the visuals mm -hmm. and you still get the action and you get the 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 imagery and the music and the the talking. But it's it's all you know with a movie it is straight through you're seeing it unfold you're not having to make decisions as part of the the experience like mm -hmm. it feels it almost feels like work when for me in a video game because i have to be thinking about 
like wh- what if I make a decision here, how will it affect this? Whereas with a movie, it's I can critically analyze how the movie is done, but for the most part, I'm getting this is entertainment. This is the ability to sit back and relax. So I don't I don't really tense up during movies that much, mm-hmm. but um, I'm currently as the example, I'm currently doing the Knights of the Old Republic video game mm-hmm. because my my best friend loves the video game and is always wanting me to play it. So I was like, fine, I'll play it. I'm, I'm tense the whole time I'm playing wow. that game because I have to make those decisions. And I'm like, that's, I was, I always tell him, why didn't they just have novel tie-ins like the force unleashed? There's the force unleashed games, but they wrote novels for it. So mm-hmm. I'm like, great. I can just read the novels. I don't have to make the decisions. Yeah, there's a sort of tie in a comic book or series, Knights of the Old Republic. Unfortunately, if you're interested in those particular characters in the game, you don't have them. You have right, the yeah. same time period, right, but something different. But it's a very uh, unexpected answer for me. So you're the type of person that actually likes the story to, uh, to unfold before their eyes versus being an active participant in the story and influence yes. the outcome. That's what draws me to video games. This mm-hmm. is where why it's so different because I can enjoy my books. In in when you're watching the movie, I would say it's the medium that leaves the least room for imagination because everything right. is supplied: the sound, the picture, and obviously the story. You take you just sit in the theater, chew your popcorn, and just experience the story. But then you can analyze the details, how this was effectively used. You know the, the all the elements of the storytelling. But in the game, particularly, you are influencing the story, unless of course it's a linear one. Guys, <clears throat> so, and I would uh, surmise your preferred is uh, medium is reading. Oh, for sure. Yes. That's, yeah. that's per- by far. Those, I mean, those, uh, your book's uh, setup kind of leaves no doubt for that. <laughs> I mean, movies are easier. So it's like oftentimes when I'm tired, I yeah. just turn on a, 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 like a movie or TV show. Right. But, but books are the preferred because, you know, the, the problem with the movie is even though it has that simplicity of letting the story unfold, you're very limited in mm-hmm. what you can do because they have to be under three hours. Generally, um, occasionally you get Lord of the Rings. It's like four hours, but still you're generally under three yeah. hours. Whereas a book you can spend, depending on how fast you read and how long the book is 10, 15, 20 hours mm-hmm. investing into the book. And so you can really, you know, get a lot out of it. And if you think about it from like a, a financial perspective, um, a movie, you know, you go to the movie theater, you're spending fifteen, twenty dollars on your on your ticket for three hours of entertainment. Whereas you go to a um uh you know, you go to get a book, you're spending fifteen, twenty dollars on the book and you're getting twenty hours of entertainment or yeah. ten hours. But still it's it's significantly more uh bang for your buck in that in that instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we were to go into the great detail of it, hopefully we'll have another podcast, podcast, we'll have the chance to do so. Mm -hmm. There's this whole argument where you can never squeeze into a film or even a television show all the nuance that you see in a a book. Yes. Mm -hmm. But guys, this podcast is supposed to be about Star Wars, and as promised, we are (laughs) moving (laughs) into Star Wars questions now. Um, but the setup was just great. I, I love hearing your experience with, with uh, literature and reading. But let's talk about Star Wars books specifically now. Uh, Star Wars started as this cinematic franchise, right? In 1977, George reinvented science fiction, space fantasy world. And who knew two more movies came out and became the, one of the grandest you know, cinematic worlds out there. But do you remember an episode specifically the moment where it dawned upon you that there's also an expanded universe of books that there's this literally world connected to star wars well i would say the you know i always knew i always like from a from like just a knowledge point that i always knew that there were books connected but i think that the um the connection point Partially was, you know, the Clone Wars, Mm -hmm. which you had the Clone Wars movie, which was the first Star Wars movie I saw in theaters. Mm. Um, The first live action I saw was Force Awakens. But the first Star Wars movie I saw in theaters was the Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. And the um, uh, and and the Clone Wars was able to tell a story in that universe. But it was totally different than the than the, the saga films. And then. They announced right after, right around when the film came out, that they were going to have this TV show mm-hmm. that was the same style, 
and I could watch it at home. I could I could watch Star Wars. I mean, I, I had the movies at home, but I could watch more of it at home. And I so that's partially when I got that um, expansion. And then it was uh, when I read the Young Jedi Knights book series um, by Kevin Anderson and Rebecca Mesta. That book series, you have the kids Jason and Jaina, who are the uh, children of Han and Leia. And then you have Tenelka and Lobaka, and Lobaka is the nephew of uh, Chewbacca. And all of them are going off on adventures, and they're constantly referencing these other adventures that have happened. They're referencing the Jedi Academy trilogy and the Thrawn mm-hmm. trilogy and all these mm-hmm. other things. I didn't get that initially, but I understood there is something this is their reference. There's a reason they're saying, Oh, right. like that time we did this on the battle of this. There's, there's a reference there. I just don't know what it is. And later on I could go Google it. But uh, at the time I was just like, this is cool. There's more there. It's not just, you know, with, you know, with Harry Potter, there's just seven books and uh, you know, you can use your imagination and come up with things, but right now you really just have like the seven books and then the movies that they've produced for yeah. it. But it's not like media tie-in fiction where the stories are basically endless. You know, with Star Wars, we have about 150 adult Legends EU books. And right now I think it's like about 50-ish, maybe 45 canon novels for the adults. Um, uh, but then if you include y- uh, young adult, middle grade, just that number gets huge. And Star Trek has 800 mm-hmm. adult novels. Mm-hmm. Star Trek, it's nuts how many books they have. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's that idea that you have so much more. You could keep the story going. You don't have to stop and just rewatch. Like, like I, I'm down. I will get to reread many of my favorite Star Trek books because there's so many new ones out there that I need to experience that I just don't have the time. It's kind of that way with Star Wars. Occasionally, I go back and reread a Star Wars book, but there's so many new ones that I can experience from whatever timeline. Mm-hmm. I remember I was about three, four years in the country. It was uh, 98 or 99. And uh, my English was obviously very shaky. I was very intimidated reading full novels in English because I basically had to sit. I did have an electronic, like small kind of like a translator. But even with that, it was so daunting. It, it just takes you out of the experience, constantly referring to the you know translator to pick up on words. I maybe understood 60 65 percent of what's in the book and once i decided like you know look i'm just gonna have to start reading i live in this country i need to learn the language and i just gotta tough it through and just mm-hmm. just pick a book pick an i just i remember always being afraid not getting authors that i possibly regard as mediocre so i'm gonna waste time on literature that's considered like right. subpar i wanted to get to the good stuff but i was just intimidated i didn't know where to begin i knew world literature like jill verne's Conan Doyle, you know, and, uh, Charles Dickens and all these kinds, but specific modern ones, I didn't know. And I remember I was here locally. I live in northern Manhattan and I was going to the bus terminal. And it was like a Indian gentleman. He was holding like a bookstore, like a convenience store. And I passed by one day and I was, hold on a second. This is a Star Wars book. And it was true said Bakura. And you do yeah. see the lead characters there. And I'm like, is this a spinoff? Are these like just various authors putting and spin on the Star Wars universe, doing their own thing. No idea if it's connected. Remember, this is pre-Google stuff. This is like yeah. early internet yeah. stuff. And then, of course, you start getting those books. They give you the synopsis, the, the timeline, and we, mm-hmm. between each movie where they take place. Then I started researching. I re- It dawned upon me, hold on a second. These are just not little minor incidents, a book here, a book there. They're all interconnected chapters of one huge storytelling campaign. So I want to know what takes place immediately after episode six. What happens to my biggest heroes next? And obviously, Truce of Bakura was my first novel. But I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, when you started reading your earlier books, did those books connect with the cinematic universe as far as you were concerned? And was it easy to connect those events and characters to the heroes and journeys we see in the big films? Yeah, the first ones I was reading were the ones that were the most accessible to mm. new readers. So I read um, uh, Lord of the Sith very early on uh, because it had Vader and the Emperor on the cover. I read Kenobi early on, which is currently mm-hmm. my favorite Star Wars novel, uh, because it had Kenobi on the cover. 
And I, uh, I need to take a quick second and absolutely down and think for a sec. Uh, I would say, oh, Tarkin, I read because I I knew Tarkin was a, a character. Um, and I read, uh, I read Aftermath because it had the Death Star on there. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, now Aftermath starts getting into the weeds of stuff. Um, uh, and it wasn't, I wasn't getting super into the interconnectedness of the universe until, uh, when I was watching the, um, the Star Wars Celebration in 2016, they actually were streaming the panels back then, back when, back when they actually streamed panels, right. uh, don't do that anymore, sadly, but they were streaming the, um, Rebels panel and they said, oh, we've got this trailer. And all of a sudden everyone goes nuts because there's this guy, Grand Admiral Thrawn in the mm -hmm. trailer. And I thought that's really cool. And then they said, oh, but he's from the books originally. And I was like, they're going to bring in a, into a TV show, someone originally from the books, like they can do that. Um, Cause usually in media tie in fiction, it's you have the movie or the show and then the writer writes their own novel uh, based off of the movie or you show. Get a so this was the first time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been off. This was the first time that the show's pulling something from a book. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I need to check this out. And so I read Heir to the Empire. Uh, I, I literally that day I went and bought like 10 books at uh, Books a Million and three of them were the Thrawn trilogy. And I just, I just ate them up. I loved them. <laughs> and that was when I started being like, and these, and I saw, of course, the timeline in them. That's why mm -hmm. it's so key. Having a timeline in your tie-in fiction books is so powerful because it shows you all the possibilities. The, the Legends novels had the timeline. The Canon novels have the timeline. But the YA and middle grade don't. And I think that is a major failing currently of the YA and middle grade is they don't put that emphasis on interconnectedness and mm -hmm. timeline. Occasionally, an author like Claudia Gray will reference something from E.K. Johnston or vice versa but they don't they don't focus on the interconnectedness because they're trying to appeal to a general audience which i get but because of that they just they aren't able to harness that kind of readership that is so so loyal uh because they can read the book and then at the end of the book they see the timeline and go go grab the next one mm -hmm. now i guess you can like look online if you enjoy reading the book you can can look online but it's not in the book that's right it's, it's not right there that you can see it yeah it's interesting what you said about the timeline because uh, for me it served as an important tool in the beginning because i wanted to orient myself and mm -hmm. obviously, as I mentioned earlier, first, English is my big obstacle that I have to overcome. Yeah. And now I have to kind of like sort out this whole thing without the help of the internet much. There was the force.net, which was a huge, huge mm -hmm. source yep. for Star Wars fans for book reviews and like trying to understand where they fit with one another. And immediately my attention was drawn to the events of the after episode six, because we never knew we we're going to get prequels or sequels. Yeah. No, the prequels were already announced. I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake. Prequels are we already knew prequels are coming in, but we never knew if Luke, Khan, and Leia would get any additional stories. So my first book was Truce and Bakura, and then I went on with Courtship from Princess Leia. And my journey started with the Bantam era books. But the mm -hmm. more I started reading, the more I realized that I can deviate from the stool, from the timeline. And for me personally, I have an alternative kind of view. I it became interesting where you sort of peed the put the pieces of the puzzle and you trust your own intuition to fit it all together later. Yeah. At one point you kind of sort of let go and you trust your imagination will take over and it will kind of guide you and say, I want to read this book here. Now let me go a little bit to the clone period. I wasn't a huge fan of the movies when they initially came out, but the books did such an excellent job of maturing the story and presenting mm -hmm. the, the politics from a much more adult. Now, when I read the cloak of deception, Yep. It just blew my mind. That's why James Lucina stands as one of my favorite authors to this day. And it gave me that feeling that the movies never could. And to answer my own question earlier, it did feel like this one inter interconnected story. Yes, yeah, sometimes the prose had a different vibe to it. Sometimes you could see that the author was trying to do something different with the character, trying to give Luke a different different kind of like uh, obstacle to overcome or a diff give Han Solo a certain characteristic. But they were all working in general consensus that this is under one huge umbrella, which is Star Wars. And the next question I want to ask you is, what are some of your favorite 
authors and why do you enjoy their particular writing? Uh, so within Star Wars, I really enjoy, I think the person who hits the most consistent um, is Zahn. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he has, he has some, he has some not great ones, but he's very consistent in his hits. Um, I think that uh, Lucino also works. Lucino works because as you were referencing, he does a great job of enhancing a specific movie. Cloak mm -hmm. of Deception and um, Darth Plagueis enhance Phantom Menace. Uh, Labyrinth of Evil enhances Revenge of the Sith, as does um, Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader. And then with the more recent example of his, Catalyst mm. absolutely enhanced Rogue One. I cannot imagine enjoyable. going to watch Rogue One without having read Catalyst. And my one of my friends did, re, uh, did watch Rogue One first, and he liked it, but he didn't love it. But I said, go read the book. And he read the book, and he it, it, it jumped up for him mm -hmm. because he felt he had that, that further connection to the characters. Uh, so Lucino, one person, it's not just for Star Wars, but for uh, my other properties, my favorite media tie-in author, is John Jackson Miller mm -hmm. because he has a way of not only writing impactful stories in terms of emotions, but also of moving his writing style to what's necessary. Uh -huh. If he needs to write something darker, he has his um, uh, Lords. Of the, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, the not Lords of the Sith. Uh, his short story collection. Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm blanking on the name of it. Or if he needs something much more lighthearted, he has something like uh, Knight Errant. And then he has, you know, Kenobi and A New Dawn, which explore questions like, what does a Jedi do when they're alone? Mm -hmm. And Kenobi takes a simple idea of the the kind of the, the gunslinger, but the gun is the lightsaber, but the gunslinger in, who who moves to the new town in the, the desert. But rather than just tell that story as it's been told so many times he takes a new element the entire story almost is told from the people's perspective rather than his right. and so he has this indelible way of making me uh uh connect with the story from a unique perspective in that so i i, I really appreciate him um i also really appreciate um uh Delilah dawson because she writes fantastic plots her plots mm -hmm. are just just unparalleled um uh, she writes darker stories than i i, I would prefer to read i don't <laughs> want to read about women who are murderous people but still the way she's able to write like like phasma is one of the most unique plots in star Wars. i loved that book um, and then you have something that's tonally very different but connects that story is black spire tells this story of how to build a rebellion from nothing. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That's that's my kind of story. And so she's able to do these seemingly different stories and make them connect together and make me feel in both of them. Mm -hmm. And so I would say her. Um, uh, and then I would say, uh, who else could I? Who would be my final author to include? I was going to talk about Kevin Anderson, but I already talked about Kevin's writing earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, I see Black Fleet Crisis over there, right? Right yeah. above your yeah, Jedi yeah, Academy. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. I didn't, I didn't love the Black Fleet Crisis. <laughs> um, what I uh, this feels like low hanging fruit. I'll say uh, Aaron Alston made me mm -hmm. want to uh, enjoy something because he had the ability to make a Star Wars battle feel like it could have been a real life battle. Mm -hmm. um he has this ability to connect like he would he would he would say all right for this book i'm basing the battle off of the battle of midway mm -hmm. i'm basing this battle off of the battle of this and so he would have that kind of anchor a real and life parallel a real life parallel mm -hmm. and so when you're reading this if you go back and you decide oh i want to go look at the battle of midway or something you're like i can totally see the connection i see why he he made that 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 story decision there um uh, and it feels it feels more real because he's basing it off of something real it feels like if a character decides to do something in that type of a story it it feels more natural than you just having to come up with something totally original mm -hmm. yeah i would say some of my favorite authors are my number one go-to is kevin j anderson yes um i love 
I'm the kid from the 80s, you know, I, I, I <laughs> see like a progression of styles and voice general, I'm thinking of writing voice in, in fiction. And I, I land right in that New Jedi Order and Bantam era. That's my stuff. All the stuff that we kind of like frown upon today and call cheesy, over the top. I love that. I thrive in it. Mm. Because once again, it transports you to these otherworldly places. And Tim Zahn's original Throne Trilogy was one of the first I was introduced to. Because as a staple, immediately it was like... I was made aware that it's must-read book, and I did enjoy it for quite a lot, and it's, I have nothing but praise for it, except that the ending to the last book, which I thought was kind of like not my <laughs> top top thing. But Kevin G. Anderson's... I thought it was, I thought it was so artistically done. Yeah? Um, I was Because that's the, that's the line in the book when the character dies. Oh. It's, you know what? So we're we're going to go to that little section okay. in a minute. <laughs> that's worth discussing. But Kevin G. Anderson's Jedi Academy trilogy... It demanded a little bit of, of open-mindedness and say, like, look, movies accomplish this and they have this very specific style of storytelling. Let's go beyond that a little bit. But he nailed Luke's progression and the establishment of the Jedi Order and what each Jedi went through in order to attain that Jedi-hood. It was more than just surface-level cool Jedi with lightsabers and spaceships. There was... A lot of interesting subtext of relatable heroes and flawed human beings going through the experience of becoming these Jedi. And I really, really enjoyed that a lot. Then we go to Tom Vage and Kevin mm. J. Anderson's Tales of the Jedi comic books, yeah. which comic books is on the lower tier of my entertainment. I prefer books over them. But Tales of the Jedi has absolutely brilliant artistic direction of showing you the golden age the archaism of of the or, uh, of the jedi uh, era of the republic that the way that things used to be in the old days it's sort of like if, if we the modern people think of the ancient egyptian culture mm -hmm. if you, when you think of the ancient jedi the way they're presented and uh, then the rise and fall and redemption arc of ulic keldroma is i think is unrivaled in star wars original trilogy aside Ulik Keldroma's journey and all the sub characters involved with his story were just magnificent storytelling to me. Then is obviously Michael uh, Stackpole and Aaron Alston for doing their X Wing series, where both complement one another really well. And they add this almost like Top Gun real life yes. references, gravitas to space combat. And when you want to get really technical, I still get lost a little bit with terminology today when this describes certain dogfight maneuvers or course crews mm -hmm. spiraling or, you know, port versus starboard. I still, it's a little bit dizzying for me, but, but, but it was an excellent outlet for me as an English learner to say, look, I don't fully understand what this action scene is supposed to be. I'm going to fulfill it with my imagination. This mm -hmm. is what this action means to me, and this is what happens there. And it became so much more interactive for me, where due to my lack of understanding, I was like, oh, I'm going to make it my own a little bit. and made it more exciting. As I mentioned earlier, James Lucino's Cloak of Deception, and then his latter duology in the New Jedi Order, the Agents of Chaos duology, mm -hmm. he is extravagant in doing subplots and politics and ulterior yeah. motives and subtext. His, his characters are brimming with life. I love authors that don't supply to you what the characters are thinking and feeling directly. He does it via the means of suggestions. Like he will describe a Han Solo's pose or whatever he's doing, tinkering with a little piece of prop in the scene that makes you identify with what that character is going through emotionally. And I absolutely adore that. I love that. When the author kind of like throws enough details and you say, you interpret you figure out what this means. I was like, oh man, this is the best. And from the modern ones, Claudia Gray, she cemented my, encouraged me and, and, and basically was a, a, a seal of approval of reading modern canon because she took it away with lost stars and blew my freaking mind. And she, whatever kind of issues or stories she tackles in Star Wars, she understands the characters inside out. She understands that George Lucas's idea of grand storling, I would say better than anyone. And whatever she brings a small or large story into the fold, you always feel like you're absorbed, you're within a Star Wars universe. You're reading like a Star Wars story. 
And um, but we do. You did want to mention something about the the last command, right? The, the oh, I was just saying Zons that uh, I really thought it was very clever uh, as a way. You know, the the with the with the last with, with the last command. Let's is... do spoilers. Don't worry about the spoilers, guys. Tim okay. Zahn's trilogy. It came out years ago. Go read it. Jonathan is gonna drop some some spoilers here. Let's go. <laughs> so when uh, Rook kills Thrawn and it to Thrawn comes out of nowhere, but us the reader, it, you realize, oh, Rook found out about what mm. the Empire did to uh, the Nagri and how it's the Empire's fault, and that is to me the perfect way to take out Thrawn because mm. it is a piece of information Thrawn has no idea because how would he know like. Um, so oftentimes a character just doesn't know something because they didn't bother to read the manual fully. They didn't bother to read the terms and agreement. Thrawn has no idea that this thing has happened. So it makes logical sense that that's what's going to be his downfall. With the Rebellion, he studied their maneuvers. He studied everything. So it's it made perfect sense in The Last Command. And then you transfer that to the Rebels TV show, where in season three, he is he's absolutely decimating the rebels but then something comes in that he has no idea or control over which is the bendu mm -hmm. and that's why he well, that's why the rebels escape for all intents and purposes thrawn won that battle but because something unexpected came in that he could have no way of knowing necessarily and then um uh in season four you have the same thing with the purgle the space whales which i know a lot of people complain about but to me it's like that's the 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 theme of thrawn being the most tactically brilliant person the only thing that can take him down is what he doesn't know i that just that, that works together really well for me so i so so i like it when things like that because because it shows that thrawn's a competent character but he's not a perfect character right he's you don't flawed. you don't yeah, he's flawed. You don't you don't want him to be perfect. And that's why I really also like the, the current canon novels with him is because he gets military strategy perfect and then something happens and he has no idea why. And mm -hmm. Eli Vantos is like, oh, it's a political thing because they don't like you because you're Chiss. And he's like, what does that have anything to do? Like Thrawn doesn't get racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so Thrawn's just kind of like, Oh, I guess I don't know. But he learns. He takes the time and he's like, all right, Eli, why don't you tell me about all this political stuff and mm -hmm. I'll teach you the military stuff, which is why I find Thrawn more interesting than, say, uh, Sherlock Holmes, because Sherlock Holmes is just kind of like, ah, well, you didn't get all this stuff. So too bad. I'll, I'll solve the, the crime. Mm -hmm. Thrawn's like, no, no, no. I want to teach you how to do this so you can solve the crime as well. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back to the climatic lightsaber duel in that book the last command yeah but before that i want to respond to that i want to kind of like counter your argument we're going okay. to just nerd out <laughs> a little bit here i'm going to say something controversial here <laughs> i loved thrawn's trilogy and i was to this day i'm very lenient when it comes to star wars i could see flaws in the book and still enjoy it a great deal because right. i'm biased towards star wars but i was when i was reading the Thrawn trilogy as somebody who's done art most of my life He's such a ridiculous character that you're supposed to believe that he understands he plots his military stratagems <laughs> based on somebody's art. Like, Artwork. what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> an entire culture doesn't imbue all of their civilization's knowledge in art. How the heck are you supposed to feel, like, understand what they feel, think, and how they will respond in the military scenario to your tactics? Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Like, okay, all right, I'll buy it. I'll buy his studies art. He's super technical. He's super smart. He's a badass. All right. That's what the book is. Take it or leave it. That's fine. Now, let's reference to Napoleon. The art of military stratagems dictates the military doctrine that you formulate a plan, but when the actual battle initiates, all of your plans are, throw, you toss them out the window and you improvise. Right. And that's where the, the genius of military tactics is. You're supposed to anticipate, intuit, and figure out what are you supposed to do. So even if Thrawn is oblivious to all the stuff that happened to the what Vader did to uh, Nogri people, right? And that Leia right. kind of like remedies that later on. Forget that stuff. You're in a combat zone. You're supposed to figure stuff out. And when Rook stabs him in the back, and it felt just so anticlimactic. I'm like... Oh man, you couldn't figure out 
an overwhelming force of the rebels that came maybe not with a superior fleet but a superior tactic and they rub it straight to his face that you thought you were the only genius here but we got Akbar, we got all the new alliance military leaders that were able to outwit you because he does a lot of grand posturing. He does his very beliefs, his hype very much. Mm -hmm. he, he knows that he's brilliant and maybe yep. they could have used it towards him. But I just, I couldn't buy it, man. I couldn't buy Rook just stabbing him in his back, man. That, I can see it being anticlimactic. Yeah. And now the, the, my biggest issue with the climax is and and counter if if you like it's i enjoyed joris sabayoff when mm -hmm. he's he wants to possess his new jedi offspring to train the new sith lord so like, oh, that's awesome that's interesting and the reason that he's, he's psychotic because he can't replicate it via genome via genetic genetic cloning but at the end where without any pretext or foreshadowing or announcements Luke's double jumps out, Luke. I'm yeah. never a fan of clone tropes in any fiction. <laughs> Somehow yeah. the Emperor survived. Well, that happened back in the Dark Empire, and I didn't buy it then. I don't buy it in the, <laughs> the Rise of the Sky. I just don't like it. Leave right. the, the dead villains alive. Tim Zahn was exceptional in doing his uh, Hand of Throne duology, where he alludes to possibility of Throne surviving, but at the end you find right. out, oops, he's nope. really not. Brilliant brilliant play of exploiting a popular name but in this case because luke luke jumps out of nowhere as like oh, yeah i'm just gonna fight my evil double side even if you try to put subtext and, and duality of nature for me whatever like philosophical stuff you bestow upon the scene it just felt flat for me and, and it didn't ruin the uh, overall trilogy for me at all i yeah. still enjoy it a great deal and it's an interesting kind of way for him to be like all right Mara Jade has the Emperor telling her, uh, you have to kill Luke, you have to kill Luke. Well, she kills Luke, not not the not the real Luke, but that's the cop out. And I would think that if I were writing it, I would rather that she uh, overcome it by finally finding the courage to say no to the Emperor, to mm -hmm. tell the Emperor, get out of my head, right. get, get this imagery out of my head. That's more satisfying than her just killing luke and me like well technically i killed him so that counts <laughs> so uh, and she still has a good character journey which is why i prefer the hand of thrawn duology better right. because she <clears throat> has to like she has feelings for luke but she's so afraid to admit them and it's it's it takes up until the very end of the second book for her to finally be like all right fine i will i will admit i have feelings for you and uh that's why i i, I feel like that character journey is paid off better there than in than in the original thrawn trilogy a very good point. Yeah, I would say in general, Tim Zahn's writing had got much better in him constructing his story with years. He gets better and better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to start wrapping up here, I just wanted to touch just a tiny bit on modern Star Wars at all. And I'm yeah. very happy that you are one of the younger Star Wars readers who is very much aware of and enjoys the expanded universe, the legends as much as the modern stuff. And I wanted to ask you from your perspective as a younger person, uh, what was your reaction when they announced in 2014 they're going to be rebranding and sort of like cutting off, severing the Legends material from modern canon and kind of like frozen in carbonite and left it alone? Well, it was, I was aware that that was around, but I wasn't invested at the time. So I didn't become invested in the EU until after that decision. And so it didn't, it didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was totally fine with that. And I think that a lot of people forgot that Star Wars is a media tie-in franchise. Mm -hmm. And as such, it's natural that this type of evolution of storytelling happens where the, this, the decision is made in order to do new things, we have to not adhere to the previous timelines this happens in comics all the time and the reason it hasn't really happened uh elsewhere yet up until recently is because we didn't have something where like the movie series came out and then the books carried that franchise on and then the movies came back that really had it was a new phenomenon when star wars happened with with the with the cell to disney 
But we have Star Trek. Star Trek, they had hundreds of novels as part of this brand new timeline mm -hmm. that carried on after the last Star Trek movie that just really did just as amazing things as the Star Wars books did. And mm -hmm. then in 2018 or 2019, they announced they're doing a new Picard TV show uh, for uh, for Paramount Plus, which the first two seasons of that show were terrible. But the third season's amazing. The third season's amazing. But mm -hmm. um, when they announced that, the authors across the board said, well, they have to basically reboot the universe. They have to do it in a new way because they're not going to adhere to what we have. Um, and when you have something like, you know, uh, if you have a hundred books in the Star Wars universe and they're all constantly connecting and stuff, you might be able to adapt some books to to film, but it's very hard to keep everything accurate when you do that. Whereas, you know, the the idea of Han and Leia have a child who turns evil and uh, uh, this woman, this young woman has to become the Jedi to fight their child. That idea was done in the EU, but it but that was a natural type of story that you'd want to tell. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just retell the EU that they would do their own spin with canon. So I'm totally okay with that happening with franchises. And I'm prepared that in 30 years or maybe 20 years, but it, in the future, it's possible this could happen again. With another Star. reset. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. Another reset, <clears throat> whether, whether they go back to legends or just say, you know what, we're going third times the charm. We're doing another one. And I'm prepared that that can happen. Um, and that's okay. Now I'll cards on the table. I enjoy legend stories more because they're more tailored to my styles. Mm -hmm. They're more tailored to the time the character traits, the values that the characters espouse mm -hmm. um, uh, and the values that the authors espoused, I typically typically enjoyed more than the canon stuff, but there's still so much to be enjoyed in the canon. And of course, several Legends authors made the jump as well to canon. So I, I still appreciate it and still love covering it. Um, uh, and the reason I cover the canon stuff so primarily at the moment is because that's the new stuff coming up that's right. the stuff everyone's talking about right i still review legends books regularly on my channel i try to do one legends books a book a, a month but uh i also make sure to put priority on the canon because it's the new thing it's part of the new discussion and so uh i i give i give precedent in my coverage to canon even though I enjoy the the legends more, so it to that's the long form of answering. I was so I'm okay with that happening. Um, uh, it happens with franchises. It's different when it's a franchise that truly was a singular vision. Um, and people say you know Star Wars was you know just George Lucas and the movies. That's basically the case, but it's not with the books because he wasn't mm -hmm. as involved with the books. But with something like Narnia. Narnia is like the, the vision is very clear. And so right. rebooting it and trying something different with it is not as effective. Same with Lord of the Rings. It had a singular vision. It's not as effective when you try to go do your own thing outside of it. But with Star Wars, with Star Trek, with Marvel, like people have talked about this. I would not be surprised if in the next 10 years, Marvel, the MCU gets rebooted. I mean, Again, the, the, again, the DC franchise just got rebooted um, uh, and they're 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 pre prepping for James Gunn stuff. And so it's just the natural evolution of franchises to me. So, yeah. I, and I think it's natural. You know, I've worked here in a local I manage a, a local comic book and video game store in the Bronx area and over plus 10 years. And I realized over the years why do the marvel and dc comic book resets happen and why they have the concept of multiple universes because when you have authors coming in after jack kirby for example and do their own version of batman character or something or spider-man character each author each artist wants to imbue something new something fresh a different riff off on spider-man's origin mm -hmm. story something different about batman's training or something about hulk's you know, personality that he's indeed sentient when he goes hulk goes berserk full way and i understood that i was like okay that's that's all right and reading expanded universe in star wars for 20 plus years in 2014 i think i was one of the minorities who was actually excited for it because i already started reading fate of the jedi by that time 
and I kind of hit pause. I'm currently on the book three, but it started feeling that the franchise is writing itself into a creative corner. You know, even with all the risks it took in the Legacy series and the New Jedi Order, you have your young three heroes, which were young, Luke, Han, and Leia. They're literally in their 80s and jumping through the same narrative hoops they did earlier on. They're still the ultimate Jedi powerful, you know, users. Han is still the best pilot. They still have all the vitality and strength. I'm like, that's it, guys. It's how much more can you do with it? And if Disney, upon purchase, decided to pursue it, all they were doing, they would possibly f fill in those pockets there they had the free space to explore. And I guarantee you, if those didn't live up to the story choices that fans expected, they would have been highly criticized. I felt it was the most appropriate way to do it. You preserve the 40 plus year rich history of Star Wars here. It's untouchable. You can fully experience it the way that it was mm -hmm. intended to. And whenever fans approach me and say, well, they erased it, they canceled, they're trying to forget about Legends. Well, look, yeah, there was a very unhappy incident where a couple of schmucks at Del Rey thought that don't, they don't own royalties to Star Wars Legends authors anymore. Right. That was very, very unfortunate, very upsetting to me. And yet... They're trying to mend the bond, you know, mend the, the, the errors they weighed, they did, and they try to like invite some of those authors back by republishing, reissuing those old books. They're there to exist for us to enjoy. But the best way to approach it, if you want to reinvigorate Star Wars, you got to tell new stories. You got to still turn the page, start with a new leaf, and see what you can do. And guess what? Not all the old stuff was perfect. Right. There were some hits and misses there, and there's some hits and misses today. Exactly. And I agree with you 100%. Some of the motivations and worldviews of modern authors that I just I can't support. I don't like that stuff. I can say it openly. Some I do. And you know what? It's totally fine. I'm okay with books existing out there that are not catered to me. Yeah. Star Wars is universal. It is for everyone. For people who don't feel the same way that I do. I have enough... I have a big heart enough to appreciate everybody and say, well, this is kind of story for you. I opt out of it. I'm going to go here and read this story in canon and read this story in Legends. Yes. Um, I, I'm very I'm very much a big tent person. I want to 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 experience all of it. And uh, and I'm I, I, I feel like if I had started um, earlier, if I had, if I had started before the buyout, I'd feel differently possibly. Um, because because and especially since I, I was reading the books adroitly i was going canon legends canon legends like it was they mixed for me and so i was it was just uh all right i got to experience this one in this timeline and this one this timeline and i think that you know it's going to be fun if or when they do reboot i'll be like all right let's see how we can make this a little different this time let's see let's not make it the empire that's around what if it's something else that pops up after um return of the jedi so i'm i'm open to uh the creativity that they could have in the future yeah uh one of the most exciting things that happened over when the disney took over for me personally even more so than the new trilogy of films which are a decent i enjoy watching them i would say is the high republic mm -hmm. and to me personally it is what legacy new jedi order and fate of the jedi and the x-wing series did for the legends yep it in a very surprising manner because of the art deco styled artwork because of the time frame that doesn't interrupt anything that was created in legends neither the old republic nor the new republic it's set 300 years before it isolates itself from everything else and it shows you these almost like the American boom after World War II, the, the great right. exploration of art and culture happening here, it made me feel that this is the Star Wars that I dreamed of as a kid in the 80s, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's just a whole slew of entirely new characters and new worlds. What was your feeling on the High Republic? And would you make a case for it that is just as imaginative and potent as the New Jedi Order series, let's say, from Legends? Well, it's certainly uh, as I think I, I would call it the spiritual successor to New Jedi Order because mm. New Jedi Order was that idea of we have the hardcover books and then we have the paperback books, um, the hardcovers, the event books, the paperbacks are the kind of filling in the details and filling in the information and stories. And with the higher public, you have the adult novels, which are the, the impact, the, the the adult books are the, the event books and then the YA and middle grade kind of and the comics kind of fill in the details a little bit um, uh, and, and expand the story. 
uh, I would say that it's it, because the higher public has been so convoluted in the style. You have phase one, we have all these stories, and up oh, now we're jumping back 150 years, and then up oh, now we're going back to the to the after part. Because of that, it's a little bit harder for fans to follow mm-hmm. and stick with, and so it's not at the moment having the cultural, you know, impact that it could have. But I think that it over time will have that impact. And I think that it will um, continue because for I I know so many fans, that's the the Star Wars that they're reading right now and really Mm -hmm. enjoying. And there's there's you know, they have entire panels that's just on the higher public, just as they used to have Fate of the Jedi panels or Legacy of the Force panels. So it is. And that's why so many of us were so excited is we got the interconnected storylines that we had been having in Legends that we're so happy that we finally have that type of thing in canon. Now, I'd prefer I, I, I'm i I'm going to enjoy the phase three of the High Republic. I'm looking forward to getting to another era. Um, uh, personally, I, I, I'm hoping we go a little bit further back in the timeline somewhere mm-hmm. in the older public, even though I'm not a big older public fan. I just am curious to see what they could do with that. Um, uh, but I, I think that the higher public has been the, a good spiritual successor to the, the way they did things with the new Jedi order. I think that's an excellent point. You're absolutely right in the long run, because when I was reading new Jedi order as it was coming out and guess what, no matter how much sugar coating and elevating and putting that series on a pedestal legends fans like to do now. If you were reading it back in the day, a lot of people had questions. A lot of people were like, oh, man, no, I don't like what they're doing with Jason and Jane. There was so much <laughs> quarreling going out because we as Star Wars fans are all very, very passionate. And it's the glove is not going to fit all, man. Some people are going to enjoy it. Other people are going to completely disassociate with that uh, series. For the last part, Jonathan, I would like you to recommend modern canon fans uh, 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 canon novels that you think tie very well with Star Wars Legends, that people can wow. enjoy them as much as the old stuff. I actually have a video on this coming up soon, so oh. that was that was clever, clever timing <laughs> on your part. So you okay. guys are getting the taste of that. So uh, I've already gave given the most obvious is that if you enjoy uh, if you enjoy the higher public, you'll probably enjoy the concepts of the New Jedi Order. However, I wouldn't say just jump into Legends with the New Jedi Order because that's Whew, that's a lot of that's a lot of timeline stuff to get into. But yeah. I'm just saying that's those that's a connection. I would say that um, another obvious one is if you enjoy the Thrawn books from the canon, you're probably going to enjoy Timothy Zahn's work like Outbound Flight and um, the duology and the trilogy from uh, from Legend. So uh, I, I would recommend that. I would also say that if you enjoy things like Truce of Bakura mm-hmm. or you enjoy um, uh, those books that were like immediately after or even the X-Wing books, I think that Aftermath does a good job of showing what the universe was like, not from the perspective of the main three. The problem mm-hmm. is when Aftermath came out, it was promised as the big answer to what was happening post return of the Jedi. And what it really is, is what was it like for individuals outside of return of the Jedi? Um, uh, which is kind of what, you know, uh, the X-Wing books focus on B characters. Right. Um, uh, so that's why I would, I would make that comparison. I would say that if you're someone that really likes getting into the dark side, if you like reading about Darth Bane and Darth Plagueis and all them, you will enjoy um, the Lord of the Sith. I should, I should mm. reverse that. If you like Lords of the Sith, you'll like um, <laughs> uh, Darth Bane and, and Darth Plagueis probably. Um, if you enjoy good, um, if you enjoy like prequel type storytelling, like in Master and Apprentice and Brotherhood, I'd recommend uh, Outbound Flight, uh, Cloak of Deception, and um, no, why is the third one on the tip of my tongue? Uh, probably the approaching storm. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of approaching storm, I think that if you like the prequels, you'll probably probably Labyrinth of Evil was something. Yeah, Labyrinth of Evil. That's also that's also a, a, a really interesting one, especially since that has interesting uh, connections to um the old Clone Wars, the yeah. 2003 Clone Wars. Yeah, which I'm still very confused on. Um, uh, trying to think if I have any more. Uh. If you like humor, like in Last Shot, Last Shot is has ridiculous humor that's lots of fun. You'll enjoy Aaron Austin's writings, particularly in his X-wing books, because mm-hmm. uh, because he writes he writes humor very well. 
And then uh, uh, plug in my fav- one of my favorites again. If you enjoy A New Dawn, which shows what a Jedi is doing when they're alone and have no other Jedi around, I recommend Kenobi by the same author, which tells a very similar story. So those mm-hmm. are the recommendations I would make if you're a canon fan and you're going to be reading, want to read Legends. And I do have, you know, probably in the next month, that that exact video coming out. I filmed it. I just haven't uploaded it yet. But that, And guys, that you will have all the links in the video description below to go check out Jonathan's channel and get all that glorious <laughs> recommendation. I would say that what really struck me were most of Claudia Gray's novels and novels that deal with prequel era, because the more I read on them, the more I enjoy. Over the years, it's been the case with me that after the trilogy of films came out, which did not speak to the Star Wars that I enjoyed as a kid in the 80s, so it was completely mm-hmm. different. Um, the novels won me over and they made yep. me a fan. And this is why the prequel trilogy of films are always on my marathon. I always rewatch them and I enjoy them because of the books. And modern stuff like Master and Apprentice, Dark Disciple by Claudia mm-hmm. Gray, you could read a Legends uh, clone era novel and re- then read that, and it's it's almost they, they exist within the same universe. Yeah. Ahsoka novel, yeah, that's it. Brotherhood novel, which I I would say that to me, and I did get to interview Kevin J. Anderson. It was a great pleasure and honor, and I'm a huge fan of his. But I felt that his Kenobi novel did not live up to its expectation. I would say that the Brotherhood book in the canon is a huge treat to the fans of the Kenobi novel from the Legends. If you indeed enjoy that one, the connection there, it's almost like, once again, a progression. You see a younger, more eager uh, Kenobi who tries to, you know, prove himself as a Jedi towards more mature post-war Kenobi that you see the gradation of the character. That's that's a good that's a good comparison. I would say that, and yeah, I'm I'm hoping Mike Chen gets more more books for Star Wars. Absolutely, and Mike Chen such is a, awesome. He was he was a breath of fresh air, um, and and there are some other authors who have had that, but I don't think there's any author that I've put down their book and said, "Give this guy more books." as quick as I did with him. He's one of those, like I always say, like I have like top three or four. I'm like, I want to see more books from this person. He's at the top of the list. He needs, he needs to write more. He fits and, and, and he gets the fandom uh, really well. He yeah. really understands the fandom. So, yeah. And you see that in the minutia, like of his stories, the little Easter yeah. eggs that he throws, he, you understand it's coming from a labor of love of a person who understands and loves Star Wars. Yes. Absolutely. Jonathan, before I ask my last question, thank you so much. It's been a really, really awesome conversation. I love hearing from somebody who is just as passionate about all aspects of reading as I am. Oh, well, thank you. This has been a fun discussion. Yeah. Um, so I started my channel during the pandemic, and it happened because there was a lot of negativity canon versus legends and star wars fans getting very tribal very emotional and obviously i can't heal the world but i can remedy a little bit and provide a bridge for both to kind of like embrace all the star wars so the question i want to ask you is what would you say the fans who feel that legends is obsolete it's no longer relevant star wars and what would you say to original purist expanded universe fans who discard Disney canon that it's not real Star Wars. I would say the goal of this is to be entertained. And th- that's the goal of Star Wars is to is to provide entertainment to people. And if they make you feel things through that entertainment, they've over exceeded their goal within, in a good way. I would say that if you're connected to that and you feel slighted, I can't make you feel unslighted. I don't believe that any of the books have been that have been written have been written from the perspective of we don't like the thing that came before or we don't like um, new things. If, if you're if you're thinking about legends, yeah. that they that they are opposed to new things. I don't think that the books feel like that in any way. And so I would say that try it. Um, not every book's going to work for you. That's fine. But it's go in knowing that the authors, many of them, if you talking to the legends fan, many of the authors in the canon grew up reading the legends and loving the legends books. So now not all of them, but most of them. 
And so because of that, they feel what you felt when they read those books. And so you might get a good feeling from reading their books. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, the whole goal of it is to be entertained. And if you just cut yourself off and say, I'm not going to read that because it's Disney canon. I'm not going to read that because it's Legends. You are cutting yourself off from so much quality entertainment um, from the franchise that you love so much. And so I would say, give it a chance. You don't have to like all of it. You probably won't. You don't even have to read all of it. If they're like, you know what? There's this author. I just don't like that that author's style. So I'm not going to continue reading that author's style. That's mm -hmm. fine. I understand. But don't cut off 50 or 100 or 200 books from a timeline because you feel slighted because of the other timeline. Is your, it, it, You feel slighted because of that. So. Yeah. I would say that um, if there is one thing that Disney era Star Wars content creators like John Favreau and Dave Filoni and all the authors, Claudia Gray, you know, all of the people involved, the spirit of George Lucas's innovation carries on. Mm -hmm. He was the type of filmmaker, you know, the original Star Wars, 1977, it's a basically criterion independent film with the budget of a mega blockbuster. Right. Right. That it has that sentiment. It has that mentality. And if George Lucas was around today, he would still tinker with the formula. He would still uproot the expectations. He never, ever catered to what fans expect or what they demand of him. He always swam yeah. against the current. I would say that, with, especially with the prequels, that's right? the case. Right. And what he did with Jar Jar Binks, despite what the fans were saying, he persists throughout all three films because George Lucas found them funny. And I will yeah. always respect him for it, despite how I feel about the films. But it's that spirit of reinvigorating, reinventing. And I think in the end, people do lo lose the most when they just adhere to their one camp. No, this is what it was to be. This is the real stars. Trust me, guys, I understand the passion. I understand the love for you have for these books and these characters because it's more than entertainment. It's it's relationships and family bonds and happy childhood memories that are so embedded in us and this very esoteric very enigmatic thing of what is star wars with that we can't quite all describe and pin down to a wall and say this is what true star wars is because we're all so different i would say keep an open mind because there's as much interesting and engaging stuff in star wars all you have to do is say look i can shelf the original Star Wars, the old Star Wars here for a moment, it still exists. It's still very much as real as I want it to be. And I can enjoy something new, somebody riffing off or, or making it a compromise and in order to tell a new story. Try things out. They will not always succeed, always will be great. Sometimes they will fail, just like they did fail before. We had a couple of novels that were flops, a couple of ones that are mediocre, and a few which really stand above the crop and they're just like everybody goes in their amazing novels. So I would say keep an open mind. Don't forget to have fun. And most importantly, don't forget that this was George Lucas's main driving force. He always strived for changing the formula, spicing it up, trying new things and seeing what works. Because to me, as flawed as the last Jedi movie is, I still enjoyed above all else in the modern current uh, Star Wars. Because Ryan Johnson asked a very real question. In order for these characters and stories to be relevant today, they can't just be surface level, gratifying, satisfactory, old Luke, Han and Leia in the cockpit of a Millennium Falcon kind of like fun times. You have to put your heroes to a meat grinder. You have to ask some hard questions. You have to experiment even in the face of completely failing and falling off the cliff. That's what it takes to make Star Wars relevant today. You have to, you can't be safe. That's what I'm saying. I, I understand that. So. All right, Jonathan, it was been a lot of fun, guys. All the relevant links will be in the video description below. Please go out, check out his reviews. I've seen a couple of video reviews. I intend to circle around to it and see a lot more. You're very detail-oriented. I love how you make references. When you re review one book, you reference another author, you reference Star Wars constantly. I really enjoy that a lot. Guys, if you like this podcast, please support us, like this video, Go to Jonathan's content, check him out, and we'll see you guys next time.
Take care, everybody.